All right. So again, I'm Rita Pello. I'm your Title I Part D State Coordinator. You met folks on this call. Um, if folks want any email addresses or other contact information, let me know. I'm happy to share it so you all have each other's um, information for further uh, collaboration. Today's agenda, I am going to go through just the overview of Title I Part D, subpart two, how you get allocations, so why you get this amount of money you do every year, what you can do with those funds, um, and then monitoring requirements. There is a chance that one of your LEAs, RSU 6, 64, or 18, could be monitored. And if they are, they will be submitting subpart two evidence with the help of your NFI North coordinators and leaders. Um, so that is just one thing I wanted to make sure uh, to go over today. And then it's the inner workings of our process as the state of Maine, how it ends up in the application, the performance report, and the really big thing for our new and veteran coordinators alike is that there is a new reporting requirement for the 24 performance report, which will be due November 1 of this coming year, so in about six months. Um, and I wanted to get in front of that and host a training to let coordinators know of this. And then um, we're going to have time for you guys to share or ask questions of us um, and um, ask of what resources you may need and things like that. Okay. So <clears throat> most of you here know that the purpose of Title I Part D is really to carry out high quality education programs that prepare the youth to meet state standards that are in those neglected or delinquent facilities. That is the language of Title I Part D federal. You probably do not speak of your students as neglected or delinquent. Um, that is just the title of this grant, um, but you are working with students who may need to have transition services, help with further education and employment, keeping them engaged in school, keeping sort of a, a support system around them so that they continue to be successful. Most folks uh, do, to some degree, right, operate those types of programs as dropout prevention programs for at-risk youth, um, carrying through services that may help them to stay in school. We have three uh, NFI North satellite facilities with this grant. Uh, Mike mentioned a fourth, which is correct. There's RSU 61, but it is not labeled as Title I Part D. It is a Title I Part A set aside for neglected youth. So it's confusing. The three facilities here that receive the subpart two funding is Stetson, Sydney, and Beacon. And so you're, I think most uh, representatives are on this call. And this year, the counts were 24 students, and I will talk about that uh, in a moment. Any, okay, I don't see any questions. We'll keep going. So I just wanted to be very transparent. How do you get the amount of money that you get every year? We had FY25 preliminary allocations posted a few weeks ago, um, and each of your LEAs, six, uh, 18, 6, and 64, received a column for subpart two funds. It's an annual student count uh, that Jill and Mike really make sure are shepherded over to us. The feds have paperwork they ask us to fill out. You basically take a snapshot of a day in October of that year, of the, or that year, and then you will get that allocation that following year. Um, so it is a snapshot student count. You might have more students in November, December, or less but they take that snapshot of a day in October from the previous fiscal year. We as a state have discretion to allocate by formula uh, or other discretionary grant process. I heard from Alaska a couple of weeks ago that they do a competitive grant and they do it for uh, three years. And so what we've always done is a formula grant, which is essentially whatever your per pupil amounts are, we divide that evenly and we give each facility a per pupil amount. Um, states do have discretion to change that up for any reasons, um, but that has been our precedent and we continue to function at that in this moment, just like that. Uh, as I mentioned, your student counts for this October that you turned in had three facilities for Title I Part D students and there were eight students in each. So actually every single facility received an equal amount this year and that's why because the counts are equal. I'm gonna go over some allowable activities. Um, I always enjoy reading RSU 6s when they talk about Beacon. 
because there's an arts program and a transition program. So I'll read just again, it's really about supplemental educational opportunities that are going to keep students uh, to be successful in maybe a, a more transient environment, dropout prevention programs, coordination of health and social services is a big one for NFI when I read your mission statement, right? Um, your mental health services that you provide for your students, special programs, career and technical ed, special education supports, additional counseling, youth entrepreneurship education. So, right, the idea here really, what are the students in front of us and what do they need to stay successful? Mentoring and peer mediation programs are also allowable under Title I Part D. Hyperlinked here is one from Illinois that I really liked. Uh, we will continue, we'll make one for Maine specific, but because this is a federal grant, I do love borrowing from other states because they follow the exact same rules as we do. So that's helpful for, uh, for now, if you really would like to see a snapshot of allowable activities. And then really just, again, you know, Tyra is going to really hone this in if she's seeing anything on your invoices. Is it reasonable? Is it necessary to carry out the intent and purpose of this program? Is it part of your high needs, which you've identified uh, as what your students in those facilities need? Is it going to have a positive impact on student achievement? And of course, is it supplemental to what your programs by state are required um, to provide as you are a facility um, that's designated, right, with certain requirements? So Title I Part D really is to supplement those requirements. All of these federal grants, that is the key phrase, they're supplemental. Any questions about that before I move on to when you get monitored? Any, anything so, else? I have a couple of questions, uh, yeah. Rita. Uh, one of which uh, you identified on the previous slide about the different options that the state mm -hmm. has pertaining yep. to distributing funds. Do you anticipate that the state is uh, moving toward a different uh, funding formula for um, um, the uh, allocation for of those funds, or, yeah. or is that uh, you know moving to some other type of um, distribution method? Yes, yeah. Thank you for that question. I will talk a little bit about when that sort of discretion might come into play, but no, at this time we have been very. Uh, we feel very, I don't know if the word comfortable is right, with this formula grant per pupil amount that we've been distributing for each of the facilities. Um, so we don't have an intention to change anything right now. Uh, thanks. And the, and the second question that I had with regard to allow, uh, allowability that you have, I believe, here, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe on a previous slide, um, talking about uh, the allowable costs. Are we determining the allowability of uh, the costs to the uh, program, or is Tyra looking at determining uh, the uh, the reimbursement requests uh, and comparing that to the grant application for um, the allowability of those costs? So your regional program manager will review the Title I Part D district project. I'll go through that uh, momentarily here. And uh, the budget should align. Part of that review process is to make sure the funds look right to what the allowability is, to what the description is. Um, and really then Tyra will just be making sure that it is reasonable, necessary, and allowable. To the grant? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Great. Okay. Uh, there will be more time definitely for other questions. So folks um, have things, keep them in the back of that mind. One thing I do want to make sure folks are aware of is monitoring. Um, there are four requirements that we have for Title I Part D subrecipients when it comes to monitoring, and they are all on our website. Um, those are sort of your transition strategies because you need to have transition as part of your Subpart Two grant just your evaluation of progress. So those quarterly reports that you send out and how you monitor students and make sure that they are uh, achieving state standards. Curricular alignment is exactly that, right? As local residential facilities, how are you aligning your curriculum with main state standards and ensuring that students are receiving those educational opportunities to achieve those standards? And then parent and family involvement, right? What are your attempts or your ability to involve and engage those around the student? So that 
will be subrecipient monitoring. This is if RSU 6, 18, or 64 uh, are uh, eligible for monitoring. Or we have a whole formula and risk assessment for those districts. Uh, when they're selected either for high or medium, uh, they might come to you because they will need NFI North's collaboration to ensure that they have all of the evidence. And then I just wanted to bring up that I get monitored, we get monitored from the USDOE. When this will happen, I, it, we haven't been monitored in a few years, so I feel it coming. Um, when that happens, you will hear from me about what we need to provide for the federal government. Most of it will be on me, our process for applications, our process for review. Um, but I wanted to bring this up because sometimes it requires that we go to subpart two recipients and ask for documentation to provide. All right. So this is where I'm gonna talk about how we as the state of Maine steward these funds, um, what processes your coordinators are probably quite familiar with, but it might be nice for those uh, folks uh, like Lucy and Teresa and Dominic um, to know what your coordinators on the side of the district are doing um, and why they come and ask you for information and why you're consulting with them on a regular basis. So your coordinators have district projects in a consolidated application. I should say that your districts are submitting one application for Title I, two, three, four, five, and Title I includes Part A and Part D. So uh, they create a whole project in this consolidated application. They, that's what the project is called, Title I, Part D. They uh, probably have, when you consult, they probably get a description of the projects you guys are running with these funds. The justification um, outlined by the school and district goals and of course, how it meets the high needs uh, of the, for these students. Uh, similarly to what Keith was talking about, the budget, when, I, when we review, has to align with the project description. Um, if you are paying for somebody, we should see it in salary and benefits or some kind of stipend and contract position. Uh, if you are asking for supplies, we should see budget line items for supplies, that kind of thing. Um, and then, uh, there's a form that your coordinators use to submit as part of the requirement that they have spoken with you, that you have worked together, um, that you have outlined the high needs annually, uh, that you've considered what projects to either continue or to start anew or to end, um, and that all of that new information is in that application. And that is part of the approval to even begin to start using those funds um, within that year. And I'm gonna about to go over the new form. Uh, it's it's not much different. It's just finally catered to the language for the Title I Part D Subpart Two subrecipients. So you'll just see that now it says local residential facility participation form. This is for Title I Part D Subpart Two only. Um, if you end up using an old form, you'll notice Title I Part D might not be on there. So that is just why. We have finally created one that is specific to this collaboration, these three districts with these three NFI North satellite facilities. So that will be, that's online, that's linked here, and it will be uh, in the Grants for Me application, similar to uh, other forms that you can upload or download right from there. And now, so that's the application that comes in August. Um, I'm glad that folks are on this call now. It's a good reminder that the summer really should be for planning, for cons consultation, um, and sort of to start anew to spend those funds as early as possible um, after you're able to from the August date. And there's one more report <laughs> that coordinators do with their grants. And that is the performance reports. And this is where I'm gonna talk about the new reporting requirement. But first, I'm just going to remind folks what they do for reporting on subpart two data um, and students. So the ESCA performance report is a halfway checkpoint. Your coordinators fill it out 15 months, uh, just about a halfway point before you have one year to spend it all down. 
Um, this is where districts will report on goals and outcomes, on student level data and expenditures through that 930 date. Title I Part D or Title I Part D subpart two recipients report on the same things. How are your goals and outcomes for your program happening, your student level data, and your expenditures? And you do it slightly differently um, because you are the uh, sort of partner to the fiscal agent to the district on this call. Um, but you are reporting very similar information that uh, other uh, titles have to report on, including Title I Part A. Um, and that's the following. Student counts, students by race and ethnicity, students by gender and age, the number of students with disabilities or limited English proficiency, the transition services provided, the academic and vocational outcomes, and then academic performance in reading and math. So if, <laughs> if folks have forgotten what that looks like, taking it out of their mind, uh, it's a it's a Title I Part D supplemental data page, um, and this is what your coordinators are reporting on for your facilities and probably the information you're sending them uh, when they ask for it. Uh, coordinators and NFI North leaders should be very used to this data. This is an old data set that's remaining. This is average length of stay. Um, I just took a screenshot of what that looks like on one of the pages that uh, is a subpart two recipient. Again, right, this is just how on average of your students, how long are they there in the facility? Now, the new reporting requirement is now <laughs> a bit more specific. The U.S. DOE wants to understand the average number of instructional days that Title I D funds uh, are sort of Title I D funds are relevant. So to say that a different way is whatever your Title I Part D subpart two funds pay for, whether it's a coordinator or certain supplies or a particular contract of somebody to come in to work with students, this is the average number of instructional days. So average length of stay includes weekends, um, it might include uh, work that they're doing outside of anything that Title I D pays for. So this is the average number. And I have this, this paragraph is actually going to be so similar to how you have instructions on how to calculate average length of stay down below in this screenshot. This language I copy pasted because you will see it down below. Um, and I also hyperlinked a guidance on how to do it. It's essentially attendance. So you're counting up each student's how many days they're receiving instruction and then dividing by the total number of students. This is again, a reporting requirement that will be uh, for this school year, this 23-24 school year. And if folks are worried about reporting this or unsure how to, uh, that is what I am here to do, to walk you through it, to help you figure it out. And on the call, even the US DOE understands that any new reporting requirement might take a few years or so, or at least a year to get accurate information for that to start to be tracked properly if it hadn't been in the past. So they are flexible as well with potentially data in the first year or two not being necessarily what uh, as accurate as they will hope to see sort of transition for uh, facilities to begin um, to, I guess, embed if they don't already, um, a way to calculate this. So uh, this is the new one. And this is also one that um, I'm very aware that uh, I'm happy to help with. So this is now average number of Title I instructional days and the students that are receiving them. And the reason that I have that screenshot that looks different than yours you guys don't have juvenile detentions. Um, this is A.R. Gould. This is Long Creek. Um, shh. They had to report this last year because they had Title I Part D funds and your facilities did not. So um, this would have come around this November for them. It'll come around next November. So in six months for uh, subpart two recipients. All right. And the other performance report, the last performance report, sort of very important form to remember, 
is the carryover reconciliation form. Now, any, this is true for equitable services that is from non-public. So some of your, some of your districts, even on this call, also work with non-public schools. Um, and in statute, subpart two recipients, non-public schools, they really are, there's language there that specifies they really, 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 really need to spend the money the year it was awarded. Having it carry over, having it sort of drag on, essentially says that something's not happening with the planning, the, the spending plan, um, the services are maybe not uh, actually happening. And that is something that we really, what, what ends up happening is we return those funds and we're not serving those students with, with money that the federal government is allocating to us for them. So we have a state process that takes a snapshot and ensures that there is a spending plan for those last 12 months if they have not all been spent the year they were awarded, because that is statutorily what should be happening. Funds should be spent the year they are awarded. And I'm going to talk a bit about when subpart two recipients struggle to spend or uh, work with the LEA. The LEA has some discretion there, um, but I really, really wanted to just let you know why this extra form exists, why the paperwork is there. It takes that snapshot and ensures that those students are going to have their services met. So this, of course, I just want to be very transparent. If subpart two subrecipients are not spending, there are options for the district coordinators to work with NFI leaders to create a spending plan, to review again the needs assessment for areas that maybe could be funded, could be supported. One-on-one -on -one consultation, and of course, you can bring me into the fold. Um, the idea here is to collaborate and overcome any administrative barriers to spending, um, anything like that. So if, if it's on our end, if it's if it's between the relationship between the two, uh, we want to rectify that as soon as possible. So those funds are flowing. I know you guys are not major receivers. I know we're not talking about tens or twenties or thirty thousand dollars here for each facility. We're talking about under ten grand. Um, however, we want to see those funds spent. Um, and I guess I should say, too, here that we will really kind of start to look at trends. Keith asked about formula, if we're going to keep with formula or some competitive grant process. The only time I can see the state moving to a competitive grant process is if we have chronic subpart two uh, facilities that just aren't spending funds that they receive, because maybe those funds should go to a different facility that is um, achieving their program goals. And then the last thing here is non-responsiveness. This is the exact same language we use with non-public schools that don't play nice with our uh, public school districts. The LEA is the fiscal agent. So RSC 6, 64 and 18 are actually those, they are the stewards of those funds. Those are their funds, um, but and therefore the purpose of your local residential facility students. So we do have state procedures um, if they don't respond. If the LEA cannot reach a facility by two different types of communication over the course of four weeks, um, the district can retain those unspent funds. Um, and essentially they kind of take those funds and put them in a project. They still are Title I Part D funds. They are not Title I Part A funds. They're not Title II, three, four, or five. They are Title I Part D, transition services, dropout prevention, mentoring, peer mediation, the allowable uses of Title I Part D. However, they might not be going to that facility anymore. So that is the that is the process we have now, um, and I will always uh, I will always report back if there's any changes to that. All right, we got to the fun part. That was the meat and potatoes. That was the overview I wanted to make sure to share. And now I'm happy to answer any questions that have been in the chat and or folks want to come off mute and just clarify or ask um, additional questions now. I have a couple of questions, of course. Um, so sorry to keep speaking out. By the way, Teresa's awesome to work with. I don't know if you guys are keeping notes, but um, 
So um, one of the things that I have bumped up against, not necessarily with NFI, but other non-publics has been the uh, initial um, uh, coordination form as well as a carryover form. Mm -hmm. I, at times have um, then, uh, you know, sent out the form, worked with folks, they've sent it back. But uh, one of the key components to that is an actual signature, which has hung yes. us up a little bit. So yep. um, I'm I'm on I'm wondering whether or not there's any efforts to make that uh, kind of in a word format or some something where the mm. folks um, on the call may be able to fill that out, sign it, and and so that when I receive it, it's attachable um, mm -hmm. to some degree. Um, yeah, I don't mind inputting the data, but it seems like the magic carrot is ensuring that there's a physical signature on there uh, in order for yep. a PR to be accepted. Uh, yeah, and, and subpart two folks will need to sign it as well. And that's a huge thing for authorization of what you're, well, I mean, that's your assurance. That's you as the local facility and or the district saying, yes, this, accurate, this information is accurate. This is our plan. That is the assurance there as uh, the responsible parties there. I I can bring back, I know our Grants For Me does not have a DocuSign feature. I'm sure that's extra funds uh, to figure that out. At this moment in time, I've seen DocuSign from local uh, districts that use that and make it a bit easier for them, but we don't have something like that in the state. So at this time, it is a signature uh, okay. that is required kind of old old school, um, yep. at least in terms of the state processes and the way that we use grants for me. Thank you for clarifying that, because I think sometimes folks are under the impression where you can, I don't know, there's a feature and all of a sudden your name turns to cursive. Yeah, right. I love that. But yeah, that's going to be a physical. Not here yet, thing, but right? I'm going to, um, I, I think, Keith, it's a good thing to. to yeah, um, yeah. 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 Um, something, something good for us as we continue to uh, make our grant platform something that is useful. One other question. I, I think this is my last one, thankfully. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to a few slides uh, um, ago, one of the things that drew my attention were kind of like four categories um, that were mentioned um, that I know Title uh, 1A is required, like parent and family engagement. Uh, I didn't know, it, are we saying that that uh, those would be categories that now goals have to be written for each one of those categories nope. or do they do they can they choose not to offer a family engagement piece well no at some similar to title one part a title one part d um there is a statute their statute essentially that facilities should absolutely be making attempts to work with parents and family it may be harder given the kinds of students um but when we monitor we ask for the ways in which the facility attempts to or involves the parents um, or families of these students. Um, that can be a goal in your application. It doesn't have to be. But yes, in Title I Part D statute, uh, it does call out parent and family engagement similar to Title I Part A. So there's no required set aside like there is in Title I A. That, that's no okay. required set aside. Nope. Just Thank when you. you're monitored, there will be a requirement per statute to say how, how do you how do you attempt to or work with or communicate with your families. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. no set aside though. Keith is talking about when Title One Part A recipients get enough of a Title One fund, they're actually required by statute to have a family engagement project. So that's what he's referring to, and that doesn't exist here. And you guys are all smaller receivers, um, so. Okay. This is the fun part for, oh, let's do other questions for folks uh, from here before I get to do the fun part and hear from you. <laughs> Any other questions from folks? Okay. All right. Well, this is selfishly what I want to hear about. <laughs> um, I know we have some folks here from the various facilities. I would love um, just to hear folks about what you're doing with your programs. I really only ever read RSU 6's Beacon Project because that's in my region. Um, so I would love especially to hear about uh, Stetson and Sydney, but in general, what are you doing with your programs and what have you found that works? So I'll go um, for Stetson. 
So we um, we really implement a lot of hands-on learning and a lot of experiential learning opportunities for our students and participants. Um, so some of the things through Title I that we've been able to do is we've um, purchased uh, canoes and camping gear. We've done a number of trips out. Um, we did a large team building activity last week with North Star Adventures um, as a school team and all the students together, including our clinical team. Um, so those are real difference makers. Um, you know, the kids feel like they're here for a really long time but I feel like we have a short time to get a lot done with them. Yeah. Um, so it really helps to like build bonds and make them feel safer and more comfortable, both in an educational and a home like setting. Um, so those are some things that we've benefited from. There are many more, um, but mm -hmm. I don't want to take up too much time. And I, I just wanted to give a snapshot of yeah. some of the things we do. That's thank you, Lucy and Don, for sharing that. So That's three now awesome. supporting the brand. What's that? We also have a large greenhouse and horticulture program. Um, can I come visit? <laughs> you sure can. Anytime. Yeah. Okay. That was the Thank other you. thing I haven't mentioned yet. I, that's what I'm gonna start doing. I'm gonna come by. <laughs> as long as you invite me, I won't come by, I won't come uninvited, but I would love to see some of that stuff. That sounds that's that's incredible. And Angela, I think you joined us after introductions. I think I just uh, cut somebody off, Teresa. I just want to make sure, Angela, hi, we see you. Um, and could you quickly introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sorry, it was a few minutes late. I went to the um, standards-based test because that's the one that popped up. I said, there's my meeting, and I clicked on it. And when they were talking, I'm like, I don't see my people. Oh. I don't hear Title One. I'm out of here. <laughs> so nice. sorry, yeah. I was a couple minutes late. Looks like I yeah. caught everything, but I'm Angela. I'm at Beacon House, um, uh, which is MSAD 6. And um, it's nice to see you. I think I've seen you at a couple of things, but um, it's making better connections now. So um, I'm over here at Beacon. Thank you. And Teresa, I think I cut you off. You please. Oh, I, no, I was just going to say that we, we spend a lot of our funds um, with the curriculum and enhancing that and we're really trying to just engage and get get kids excited about learning again um feel safe taking risks um, we have themes that we develop we're getting ready to go into our space theme and so we try to take every content area and push it into that theme and and get them excited and and safe we spend a lot of money on free reading materials or library memberships YMCA memberships, trying to get them um, out into the community as much as possible, but also tying in that the education piece as well. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I know you guys don't get a ton of funds. So the fact that you're stretching them creatively, involved in community work, getting supplies that'll bring team building together, enhancing curriculum, that is exactly why I forced you on this call today. I wanted to hear about how you use your sort of minimum receivership funds with Title I. And it's yeah, sounds... and, and like Keith will tell you, he'll have to, you know, give the gentle nudge, like start spending that money because I'm always afraid of running out. So I start real conservative and then okay. have to have to get the nudges. So okay. That's I'm good working feedback on it. for why. And I know there was the data issue with this last year with funds and not receiving them. So um we're gonna definitely make sure that doesn't happen again but it's good to hear the feedback of sort of why there's worry with the spending of funds there's not just not that much of it yeah mike anything you want to share with your 19 years anything <laughs> anything there i'm just gonna put you on put you cold call <laughs> well i appreciate that uh, this has always been a learning experience for me and, and i don't work in the war room per se like Teresa angela and dominic do so yeah this this meeting is great for everybody to kind of become a little bit more collaborative, I think. Working in the different districts, it's been a different world for, you know, as you know, Rita, we've been talking about it uh, in our kind of meetings prior to this meeting. Um, yeah. But I think this, having a little bit more cohesiveness and a little bit clearer picture as to what the monies can be used for is going to be uh, very helpful for all three of the programs. Uh, as you said, I wish we could get more. Uh, I don't know yeah. if we have to... Um, I mean, I'd like to talk to Lucy and say, hey, let's let's increase the enrollment to 16. Maybe that would get us more Title One, but I don't think she'd be <laughs> as supportive about that. But again, thank you for putting this group together and 
Um, hopefully we'll continue to fill the form out correctly. Just so for some of you that might not know, there was one year that we checked the wrong box on the form um, and it cost us a year of receiving Title I D money. So Rita and her team were very helpful in getting us back on the right page with that. Um, I guess I have to fall on the sword for checking the wrong box, but um, I've already, that's already come and gone and I haven't been pixel up yet. So that's. Um, oh, and we've learned from our mistakes <laughs> on our end as well. We, you know, yeah. it, it, no one's going to be shocked to know that sometimes the institutional knowledge is gone when someone leaves and it and two folks pick up a, a new grant and um, things happen. So but, we but thank you very much. Thank you very much for this. Of course. Of course. Yeah. This is much. This is for me as well to actually see you all, too. And if this is something that is helpful, I mean, in a few months, we can always get back together, especially before that performance report, if folks are worried about reporting the new data or anything like that. So I'm here. I'm here for that as well. Any other things before I close this out with a few technical sort of what to know about our website and stuff? Any other any other comments or questions? All right. Well, to make the main DOE uh, training communications team happy, I'm going to just share my screen one more time and close this out here. Before I go there. Yeah, so again, just everything is on that website. I've tried to hyperlink. I might have actually hyperlink this after I put the PDF in the calendar invite. So just know that things live there. We have resources page, we have a guidance page. Um, I'm gonna build out some more Title I Part D resources. I shared Illinois spending snapshot when I realized that our program doesn't have a main focused one. So. Those are the kinds of things that I will continue to build out as the state coordinator for Title I Part D and always let folks know when those exist on the websites. Your coordinators uh, for 6, 64, and 18 often join ESEA office hours, and so they'll hear about it there as well. Um, <laughs> this is my certificate as I completed Title I Part D 101 uh, just a few weeks ago. <laughs> so. I just want to let you know that the the US DOE knows how sort of hard Title I Part D can be when um, there's Title I Part A money and there's just all, all these other grants. And to kind of understand the nitty gritty of these programs, feel free to your own self-paced guide. If you want some, you want to make sure what I said today jives with what the federal government says, you on your own time can absolutely get a certificate just like I just like I did with this training. And I'll continue to let you know if there's anything ever relevant to folks on this call from, from the federal government specifically. This is me, I mean, that's not me. That's just a nice stock image, but this is me in terms of my email. Um, we are regional program managers, so we tend to work with certain areas, but because subpart two is its own thing and some of the regional program managers, because the program is so small are not as familiar, you can always uh, reach out to me and CC your regional program manager. Um, and that way I kind of know that it's Title I Part D specific and you want some support with that. And so I can at least know what the email is about if, if, uh, if your regional program manager um, can or can't answer it. I, I'm there to support that. So we do have an organization, but I realize with this grant, um, sometimes it's helpful to just make sure I, I know what's going on. And then this is this is the last slide. Again, especially NFI folks, if you wanna know main DOE stuff, um, sometimes we have Title I announcements there. You know, they let folks know that they can, um, that they have uh, the ability to, to follow on social media and the website. Okay, I'll stop recording.